Welcome to non-obvious. Okay, uh, this is uh, non-obvious uh, with two hands, and it's our fifth episode, and we're honored to have Professor, the Right Honorable Professor Sir Robin Jacob. Uh, right Honorable means you're in a privy chamber or something. Privy like Council. That. Privy Council. Um, and Professor, because you're here. Correct. Sir, because you were knighted. Yep, and that's because he just went with a job. And how often do you actually force people to use all those things? Uh, mainly only people like you. I mean, <laughs> to the rest of the world, I'm Robin. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, Robin and I have known of each other for quite a while, and uh, when I first started coming over here, he was one of the first people, along with Hugh Laddie, that I met. Um, and we actually met at... Uh, one of your inns. I don't know whether it's his or yours. I think it was his for lunch. See, I, I remember it again. Grace. Grace. Yeah, 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 it was Grace. My inn. It was very, very nice. Um, well, well, we can talk about Hugh a little later. All right, let's just go through uh, a little, your, your background. Uh, well, where were you born? Oxford. Really? Yeah, there's a reason for that, actually. What is? Well, there's a man called Hitler who was bombing London like hell, and they took away all the children and all the pregnant mums and took them out to places where they wouldn't be bombed. And Hitler did not bomb Oxford because he thought he would take it over and make it his capital. Oh. And, and I was born in what was called Ruskin College. It's now part of Exeter College. That's, that's very interesting. And then where did you ultimately grow up or your childhood? No, North London. And what does that mean, North London? Well, it's very near the end of the northern line on the underground. Okay, and you're sort of in North London now, right? Well, in the world, I'm, I'm, I'm just a mile and a half away from where we are now. Um, I can walk to St Paul's in half an hour. And what type of childhood did, what did, did you have any particular interests as a child growing up? Well, I mean, we can start very early. I mean, my dad was in the army and used to come home. He used to travel on the underground to the war office. Um, and I was made to travel rather a long way because my mother had strange ideas about education. <clears throat> so I I went to school with a, one morning. I remember the the doodle bug coming. We all had to go in the basement because a mm. bomb going to fall. When I got old, I got interested in science. What um, age did you start getting interested? In I science? would think about seven. Holy moly! Really? Yeah, I started getting chemistry kits and. I, and my mother let me have all sorts of stuff. And by the time I was 11, I had quite a little laboratory. That's fantastic. Brothers, sisters? Younger brother, an elder half-brother who was 12 years older than me. Hmm. Um, and you went to, I guess, what we would call public school, you, it's state mm -hmm. school? No, even that's slightly muddled. I mean, my mother had, had believed in free education. I went to somewhere where they believed in not teaching you. <clears throat> and I got pretty bored by that. And I said so when I was about 10. And so they panicked. And there was a state system called the 11 plus, and you did this exam. And you either went to a grammar school or you went to secondary modern, all depending on this single test. Well, I did quite well in that. But I, 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 the, the grammar school that I might have gone to was a church school. My mother wouldn't have anything to do with churches. And they were just creating these new kind of comprehensive schools. I went to that, the state school. And that was a brilliant school. And you enjoyed these schools or what? Yeah, I did. But then they just they said I wouldn't be able to go to Cambridge for my comprehensive school, which is in Potter's Bar, because they didn't do Latin. And you had to have Latin in 1952, whatever you were going to read at Oxford or Cambridge. Um, and so there was a big panic, and they, they, they finally got me into St Paul's School, which is one of the top public schools, which, as you know, means a private school. <laughs> and uh, then you went to Cambridge. And I went to Cambridge to read science, which is still what I wanted to do. Now, when you read science, do you have anything? You have stuff more than science. It's not just science, right? Or was it just science? Well, it was just science. Okay. I mean, I could have gone to all sorts of things I look back on. I you had four or three years of just science? Correct. Well, uh, 
I could have gone to other lectures. I should have gone to listen to Liebes' lectures on English literature and a whole bunch of other things, but I, I, I'm finding it quite hard, actually. All right, so then you graduate, and for some reason you're switching from a science world to a law world. How did that happen? Well, in my second year, I realized I was not going to get a great degree from Cambridge. And all my friends were lawyers, because my dad was a lawyer. And, you know, people had a much more limited view of the world. I didn't know what else to do. So I said I'd become a barrister. I'd had a, I'd met a chap just before I went up to Cambridge at a party, which it was a rather unusual day. Uh, uh, first of all, a friend of mine uh, had learned to fly, and he offered to take me up in a, uh, a, a two-seater Tiger Moth. So I went to his house in South London on the back of his motorbike to Biggin Hill, and we went around the skies came back, back on his motorbike, back to London. Where, where the families did things like going out to the theatre together. I went, went to my dad's office in the law courts. And he said, oh, I've got to go to a party first. There's a retirement party. Uh, but you just come and stand in the corner. So I went to this party and there were all the great and good there, Hailsham and Denning and all the top judges. And the chap was retiring was a very left-wing man, never made a judge, but apparently absolutely brilliant in it, but he loved him. And I got talking to this little fellow in the corner called R.G. Lloyd, and he, he, he asked what I was doing. I said I was going to Cambridge to read science. He said, when you come down, he says, come and see me and go to the Patton Bar. It's the first I'd ever heard of the Patton Bar. And he told me it was huge fun. So when I said I would, second year, I'd become a barrister, and I joined Gray's Inn, um, I had that in mind as a backstop. I didn't think I'd do patents. I didn't know what they were, really, anyway. Um, but then you went to LSE. Why, why did you go to LSE uh, when you already had a degree and you were Well, you're uh, quite right. I, 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 what happened was my dad said, go and see the Gray's Inn student advisor. I said, what for? He said, I don't know. But they can't do any harm, can it? Which is very clever advice, that, actually. Because you can't answer that. So I went to see this chap... And he said, you should do a law degree on Friday afternoon. I said, well, I'm doing the bar exams. He said, you can do both. There's an evening course at the LSE. And I went home, I told my dad, and he said, very good idea. I'll phone up Wheatcroft, who was the head of the department at the LSE on Monday morning. By Monday evening, I was in class. And my first teacher was a very young Australian junior lecturer called William Cornish. Wow. Bill Cornish is, is one of the greats of uh, British, he's Australian, but of British uh, IP uh, academics, uh, who was at, uh, he was at Cambridge, wasn't he? Later, yeah, yeah. he was a, a, a junior lecturer at LSE. Yeah. Actually, what happened was, he, he would have probably stayed at LSE, but there was, a load of money came in from the chap who invented the birth control pill. He, he wanted, and he realised he made a lot of money out of IP. And he wanted to endow a chair and the like, uh, and took advice from a patent agent who had a great antipathy to the LSC, thinking it was a very left-wing place, which it is not really. It's left and right wing and mainly central. Uh, and so he wouldn't give it to LSE, but he said he'd give it to Queen Mary. So he gave it to Queen Mary, and Bill Cornish got the chair at Queen Mary. And then he gave some more money to Cambridge, and Bill then took the chair in Cambridge instead, the Herschel Smith chair. All right, very interesting. Um, all right, so now you're a barrister. Correct? Or is... Yeah, and what happens, I did a pupillage, I, I passed the bar exams. I took a year out because I thought I, it would be a real good chance to, to, to earn a scholarship. And I managed to get a teaching job teaching law, although I hadn't got my law degree because I was a barrister uh, at Kingston College of Technology. And at the same time, I really went for this um, scholarship at Gray's Inn, and I got it. Four hundred pounds a year it was a lot of money in those days, tax free. Um, and just before I 
could afford it, I moved to the middle of London, out of North London. Because I'd learned from my mother not to travel, because she travelled all the time, I don't. Yeah. And, you... and then I pupil, my dad got me a pupilage, it was all the way it was done in those days, I, with, with a man called Nigel Bridge, who at that time was the, what was called the Treasury Junior. He was the junior counsel to the Treasury. And he was in fact the junior barrister for the government in pretty well every subject, except uh, road accidents and IP. There was a separate one for IP, and I got that job later. Anyway, I wasn't taken in those chambers. I didn't even dare ask. So I applied to the patent bar. And I, in those days, you could pretty well get into the patent bar on the grounds you'd, you'd applied. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're now, your first chambers weren't, first of all, your eight new square was your chambers, right? Well, they were Francis Taylor building when I joined them. It's the same set. Oh. We, I mean, I moved them later, just before I went on the bench. Okay. And you were this uh, junior counsel to the Treasury and Pat Matters. Let me just, I want to talk about a bit before that, about the, 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 the four remarkable people I joined, just four, that's all it was. Um, Blanco White, Anthony Walton were absolute intellectual property geniuses. Nearly everything I've ever put in any of my <laughs> judgments or written anywhere has got its roots in what those guys talked about at the Chamber's Tea Party. Quite extraordinary. Huge fights over plausibility. Now terribly in subject in patent law. They were talking about it then. And they debate and they argue fiercely. So I was very lucky. And my practice took off quite early for a number of reasons. IP itself started changing. It was very moribund all around the world. So the work we did in chambers was mainly patent office opposition work. You just got a bunch of papers from a patent attorney who argued the case and went away again. And most times the case didn't matter very much. And there was very little litigation. We had a new judge who changed things, a man called Graham. And he started upholding patents and he believed in the patent system. Um, and it was very commercial. What, what year around was this? He came on the bench in 1969. So I did a couple of cases in front of him that went quite well, and I was lucky, I was a noisy guy, and when the time came for the Treasury Junior job to come up in 1975, I got it. I was, it was an appointment of the Attorney Generals in those days. Now it's all done by competitions. All right, so you were representing the Patent Office in all court proceedings, including uh, Europe, uh, no matter what, you were, so you got a pretty good experience early on. I was very lucky, yeah. I, I did, I represented the government in all IP cases, in the very early important IP cases, um, before the Court of Justice, which was a much better court then than it is now. Now, in terms of the Court of Justice then, I mean, I've gone to Court of Justice oral arguments, which uh, are not like uh, common law, uh, oral arguments, where basically the, the lawyers, usually civil lawyers, reading their things with maybe one question from a judge and that was it. Was that the situation also when you were arguing in the Court of Justice? N not quite so much. It's gone back to what it was before the British joined. Uh -huh. um, they, they started asking questions and the Advocate General would start asking questions. Um, and uh, I, one case I did, uh, I, I believe, I mean, the commission said I did it too, that I turned the court with my 20-minute speech. They were very cross. Hmm. A case called Moongesser. There were a bunch of competition lawyers who had mad ideas about exclusive licenses. They said all exclusive licenses are contrary to the, the statute. So were you a born litigator? You grew into it? How did you become what you were as a litigator? I think deep down I was a born litigator. I didn't know I was. Um, maybe you could never tell before. Mm. I mean, I, I, I don't think you can't tell them. I look back on some junior people in chambers and two of the least promising after two years, we'd taken them on 
the two of the least promising after two years were Hugh Laddie and David Kitchen. Really? <laughs> Who were very successful thereafter. Um, yeah, I have. I think everyone can learn how to litigate, and then some people actually, it's almost in their blood. Yes, it, was uh, in my, it still is. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll get to that. Um, all right, you took silk, and now there's going to be a lot of people who don't understand exactly what Queen's Council means. And how do you get that position? Is there a committee? Is it the Queen's? Queen decides, or who decides that you... Okay, well, in, in, in those days, um, first of all, it's, it's called silk because you get a silk gown. Mm. The junior council is called a stuff gown. It's roughest, rougher material, but the Queen's Council's gown is a silk gown. Uh, took silk suggests you just took it if you wanted it, but you had to apply for it and you had to get it. And in those days, it was decided by the Lord Chancellor, who, who was the historic Minister for Justice, but also mixed up as the part of the judiciary. And he was the one who picked judges as well, right? Yeah, he picked judges, he picked the top judges, and he picked, we had, his department was growing, and he had one man who went round and talked to everybody. It was done by taking soundings, is the expression. Anyway, I put an application in, and, and you pretty well got it, automatically if you've been Treasury Junior. So what now it's now it's done by a big committee and so on. What percentage of barristers uh, take silk? I, it used to be about ten percent, but okay. now I think it may be a higher proportion. Okay. Um, now, did you find that judges treated you differently once you took silk before than before? No. The judges of a previous generation have been pretty beastly arrogant and really quite rude. Um, but I was lucky that the generation of Chancery judges, who I appeared before, Temperman, Oliver, for example, were, were, were true gents. And quite frankly, it made no difference whatever taking silk, except I got more money and I had a junior and the cases started getting bigger. Okay. Uh... At one point, you were deputy chairman of the Copyright Tribunal. What does that mean? Right. Well, we have a copyright tribunal, which has powers to settle licenses, um, as in some cases, the, the various provisions entitle people to licenses. And one of the big licensing schemes, uh, which I was particularly concerned with, was um, how much record companies the whole British record industry, when do anybody selling records in this country, uh, um, had to pay for the use of copyright music, not sound recordings, but the copyright right. music itself. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating, actually. It was a five-man tribunal with different skills. Um, it was a huge battle. Sidney Kintridge appeared for the record companies and Michael Beloff appeared for the... Um, music publishers. The probably. publishers. And somebody else in the and I forget why, but Robert Englehart was there too. Uh, and it was actually, you know, it's one of the biggest cases I've ever been involved in. It's, if you're thinking about how much you're paying for the use of music. And those days, of course, it was all records, mm. I think. Tapes, yeah. tapes had just started. Yeah. But with, I mean, it included then. How long were you on that uh, tribunal? About... Well, I think I was on it from when it started in 1989. It had a predecessor tribunal. I wasn't on that. But it, was, it was renamed, reconstituted in a larger jurisdiction in 1989 um, until I went on the bench in 1993, four years. Okay. You went on a bench in 1993 to become a high court judge, uh, Chancery Division. Um, how did that happen? Did you apply? Did, no, did... you didn't have to apply in those days. It was, it was a question. It was a so-called touch on the shoulder. I actually remember it was rather comic. I was a bit naive. I got a letter from the Lord Chancellor's permanent secretary, saying, "Dear Robin, as you may know, may know from time to time, I like to have discuss things with senior members of the bar. Perhaps you could be good enough to get your clerk to make an appointment for you to come and have tea." 
Well, I actually went along there to talk about something. Well, I, there was a, a new system called the Patterns County Court, and the Patterns County Court judge was so bad, I really wanted to say to the Lord you've got to get rid of it. He didn't want to talk about that at all. I said my piece, then he said, um, if the Lord Chancellor were to invite you to become a High Court judge, would you accept? So British. <laughs> and, then, and then I thought for a second, I said, yes, because I you're getting a bit tired as a barrister. You, you have no life of your own. You've been making a fortune, but you, you haven't got any time to spend any of it. Um, and, uh, and then he, one final question before I went, is there anything in your private life you think the Lord Chancellor ought to know? <laughs> so, the, and the rest is history. Now, I'm not asking for quid exactly, but as a barrister, could you only take this job if you had made a lot of money and savings as a barrister? I think realistically, yes. I mean, it, it, was, it was a huge financial cut. I, I was earning at that point probably gross about 800, 900,000 pounds a year. Well, the new job paid 90. It had the promise of a pension, significant pension, which I'm now collecting. Um, but that's one of the big problems now, is that the, um, well, I'm, well, beat about the bush, the incompetent chap who was the minister and became the minister for justice because we no longer had to have a lawyer as the minister for justice, the Lord Chancellor, he got rid of the judge's pension on this basis, that if you'd bought a pension up to a certain level, then they wouldn't give you one. If you hadn't, they would. Well, it's outrageous, really, and, and it's having a huge problem on recruitment now. Well, even in the United States, for the first time we really have, it's not unusual now for a federal judge to retire and go into practice. But it never happened before. Yeah. And it's financial. Yeah, well, we've, to, we've to some extent moved that way, and they're saying, oh, well, you don't need a pension because you can go into practice. Well, that really isn't true. It's true of a small group. I mean, I do advisory work and I do of other things. I can't actually practice, but I, I, I've got enough to do. Um, but I was an IP, the commercial boys can do it. But if you are a, 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 a serving um, criminal law judge, what are you gonna do? No. Yeah. Who's gonna pay you to do something? All right, so now you're a High Court judge, and two of your colleagues, uh, Nick, Nicholas Pumphrey and Hugh Laddie, were also High Court judges at your time, correct? Uh, just about. I mean, Hugh Laddie came after me quite quickly, but Nicholas came in almost by, but just before I left for the okay. Court of Appeal. I can't remember the exact day. And then, no, and you were doing, the three of you were doing most of the IP cases. Yeah. In the UK. I was doing, I went out on circuit for four years and I didn't do much IP for four years. People thought of me as a patent judge, but I didn't actually do a patent case for four years. Well, the, going on circuit, it was, it was Birmingham and a couple of other cities. Yeah, Bristol and Cardiff, yeah. And you literally never did anything in London for four years? No, I did things in London, <laughs> but never a patent case. I did a couple of trademark cases. Um, but not, I don't think, a single London patent case. I, I left control of the list to Hugh Laddie, um, the patent list, as a separate patent list, not a non-IP list, just patents. Um, because we created something called the Patent Court with designated patent judges, specialist judges, pretty well all of them. Either they'd got actually got science degrees or they'd been doing IP um, for their career. They were the heavyweights and then they were what we called the gifted amateurs, who were other chancery judges like David Newberg, who had a science degree but never practiced in IP. And they did the occasional case. Uh, Hugh Laddie actually was unusual in that he actually did, I don't know, resign from the bench or left the bench and went back into practice. Yes, he did. And there was a lot of uproar of that. I remember, maybe it was even you, or someone said, he better not appear before me. Um, 
Yeah, it wasn't me. Well, then it was, I, I can't remember who said it, but the, it was a sort of an outrage a little bit about that he would actually consider doing litigation after being a I judge. Don't know, I don't remember him saying he was going to do that. He did, he did join the firm of solicitors. Nobody had done anything that before. Judges had left the, the bench before. Well, there was always a row about it. A man called Harry Fisher was the, left the bench in the early 70s, maybe even late 60s. I think it was the late 60s because he couldn't stand it, and then he, and he went off into the city. Uh, so it had been done before, but nobody had gone to a law firm. And Hugh actually became a consultant at a law firm. Yeah. Um, so Nicholas, uh, he died young, unfortunately. Uh, he just came to the Court of Appeal. We yeah. were going to be... Together, doing IP in the court. I was the only IP judge in the Court of Appeal. And suddenly there were going to be two of us. Yeah, that was, that was very unfortunate. I think one of the reasons Hugh actually left uh, the bench was he didn't get the Court of Appeal. At least that's what I sensed. I, I th there may be some truth in that. Not so much he didn't get there, but he didn't think he would get there. Yeah. He also had... Um, a number of difficulties with the head of the division at the time. With the what division? With the head of the Chancery Division mm -hmm. at the time. Okay. Um, all right, let's get to uh, a little more less depressing area of... Uh, uh, so you're uh, united uh, at High Court, and so is Wendy, then is Lady... Formerly is she... she is Lady Jacob, yes. She's, she's never used that problem. She's used it once. Uh, we had some American friends coming over and we wanted to have an outside hotel, an outside place in the hot summer um, at the restaurant um, near, near the Tower Bridge. I think it's called Pont de la Tour. And she wanted, and, and she used it that time and it worked. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the <laughs> Privy Council, which used to be actually in the older days running the government, yeah, they ran the government, the, the king, the private council. They were the... Now the Privy Council is just what? The people who go to Bermuda to hear cases or to Hong Kong or what? No, the, well, the Privy Council had a judicial function and it has a political function. So, I mean, there are about 800 Privy Councillors. All sorts of ministers are made Privy Councillors. And you get that from the Court of Appeal or from the... Uh... That, that, was, that, that was a deal done in 1875 between the people who were going to go to the Court of Appeal. They would say, do you want more money? than a high court judge, or do you want to have privy counsel the silly hotsits? <laughs> <laughs> All right, and so you left, um, I guess it was what? Uh, to, when, when did you, uh, it was about 2011 I, you left the, uh, yeah. the bench. Yeah, and, uh, and you, just just 70. And you had five more years of eligibility. You could have stayed Correct. on. Correct. Uh, and what was it at that point, actually, that caused you to do that? Well, a bunch of things, really. First of all, I had some friends who'd, who'd left just before they were 70 as well. Uh, um, and they were really enjoying themselves with other stuff. Um, I'd reached time for full pension, so the pension was half pay. So I was effectively only working for half pay. Um, I knew there was a cut-off date at 75, and I reckoned I might keep going beyond 75 and doing stuff. And if you leave at 75, it's harder to start. I mean, Lenny Hoffman's done it, but not many others. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought, I, and the opportunity of this chair came up. How did that come up? Well, this it, is the Hugh Laddie. The Hugh Laddie chair. And the way it happened was this. First of all, they thought they ought to create a chair and there was a fundraising and I was chairman of the fundraising committee. We didn't get anywhere near enough money. You need about 25 million pounds to fund, fully fund the chair mm. with interest and, and, and you have to have room and there's other costs as part from the pay. So then the, 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 the dean, Hazel Gen, said, right, well, we can't do that. We either got to give the money back or we've got to create a part-time chair. So then we had another committee for who, who it might be. I don't know, 
I knew quite a lot of people around the world and we had a list. Uh, and I think we picked somebody, but I can't remember who. We might ask them and they'd come and do three weeks a year or something. Uh, and then I said, and she was in Hong Kong, I spoke to her and I said, and I, said um, I can't go to anybody unless I tell them what the deal is. What's the deal? So she said, I'll come back to you. And when she sent it, it was just the moment that I said, well, I could do that. So I rang her up. So you, so I said, I'll do it. I'll come off the committee and I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. She said, right, it'll be advertised next week. Um, here's how you'll find the advertisement. You would have to know how the, the UCL website extremely well to find that advertisement. And um, the deal was done. And so what does it mean actually to have the humanity chair? I mean, what goes with that? Anything? The honor, of course. Yeah, well, um, I, I get a room here. I, I get some assistance. I, I, I manage to run things. I, I mean, I can do things from here. I do do things are from you, here. Are you actually paid anything? Yeah. Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, and... Do you know, the funny thing, it's probably better than I am paid than I wasn't from their point of view, because they take you more seriously. Mm. Otherwise, they, you're, they think you're just an amateur and they pay no attention. That's a good point. So what is it about your job now that probably brings you the most pleasure? I love the moot team. Moot court team. Yeah, I like that. I, and I, I've enjoyed very much supervising a, 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 a PhD student. And you do sit in on classes occasionally. Yeah. And they quite like it too, I think. And I, some, the teacher, I thought the teachers wouldn't like it. You know, they've got their prepared notes and there's this guy interrupting. Actually, they love it. They've been very kind to say, you know, they're saying, are you coming? Good. And the, you do a lot of speaking. What, in different places about yeah. this, that? Yeah. And writing. Yeah, I tried to cut some of that down a bit. Are you working around about the same as when you were on the court? Less than you were on the court? More than you are on the court? I think a little less, but not much. When I was on the court, I did a lot of extra things. Now, you also, part of, uh, you still sit as a judge two or three weeks a, a year, is that correct? Well, I'm a judge of the Astana International Financial Center. No, but I'm talking about the Court of Appeal. No, 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 I'm time expired now. And that stopped when I was 75. And Hong Kong has expired? You don't do that? I, I never had Hong Kong. Oh, you never had Hong Kong. Okay. Um, now, you also travel a lot and uh, to various countries. In terms of your view of IP, um, to what extent can you say there is pretty much the same base and wherever you go, everyone will know, use, use a few words, everyone will know what's going on? Or actually there are differences that you have to be aware of as a practitioner or an house counsel or something about differences in IP in different areas of the world? Well, I think there are quite a lot of differences. Of course, the, the, the system is based on... <clears throat> English law, um, I'm closest to, it's easy as you, you go to New Zealand or you go to Australia, to some extent Canada, not the United States. Uh, and they've been divorced from English law too long. Um, and practice is very different there. Actually, it's slightly misleading. A lot of the words you use are the same, but they really mean something very different. All right, so you go to Australia, um, uh, did you say New Zealand? Well, I, I've, I've been, I taught in New Zealand. I go about three years ago. I had a, a gig down there, two weeks. In terms of litigating, to what extent is there a difference, a noticeable difference in the, these three or four countries that you mentioned? Um, well, there is a difference. Uh, uh, New Zealand doesn't really do heavy IP. Uh, Australia does. Uh, uh, and I'm probably not as familiar now as because I did a case there in, in, 19, in the early 90s. Um, I found it much more formal than, than our system. Fussy rules about evidence and things, which I believe they've got rid of. Um, so, the United States is so overburdened by its procedural rules, it's become... I don't think it's one of the, I think it's one of the poorest litigation systems in the world. Yeah. I'll, be, I'll be blunt about it. And I think a lot of the troubles of the anti-patent um, 
movement, which has been inflicting itself on the United States, are as a result of the system of litigation. And they, they blame it on the patents. Now, I suppose you couldn't have the litigation without the patents, but really it's, the, it's, it's quite a vice from the litigation system itself. Well, it's the same litigation system, and now it's changed with patents. So how could that be? That I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's a very good litigation system. And jury trials and massive oral discovery as well as paper discovery, particularly in patent cases, where it's almost got nothing to do with the case at all. Yeah, but that's always been the case. So the recent problems in patents can't really be attributed to the system because the system hasn't changed. No, it has changed. Um, in principle, you had all those things years ago, but nobody used them. You had bench trials, you didn't have jury trials. Patent cases. No, no, I, that, I, I think that's true. But that, that was a change that the patent people wanted. It wasn't inflicted on them. But no, 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 look, it, it, you'd say wanted. If I was counsel, and I thought I had a better chance of winning as a patentee with jury trial, I'd go for it, not because I wanted it, but because it was the best thing for my clients. So the you can't is, blame the bar for it. The other thing is that, <laughs> Well, don't blame the system then. If, if, it's if, the if system. The, if the bar actually likes it and embraces it, for them it's not a problem. Uh, uh, some of them see it as not a problem. But you're not hearing what I'm saying. I'll say it again. The bar must use every tool, legitimate tool, that's available for his or her client. If that tool brings into use a system which changes the system, which is what using jury trial did, you, you, you have an effect. The same with discovery. Anyway, there we are. I mean, when I was a boy, they didn't have it. Yeah. I think if you go back, it'd be well worth studying. Somebody saying, what happened in patent actions in the 50s and 60s? What was the procedure that actually was used? Not what, not what the rules were. That you can find out what really happened. And I think you'll find it was a much simpler system. It was a simpler system because patents had much less to do with the real world. It was an isolated group. A patent lawyer would bar was very small, in-house counsel, you got a windowless office if you were a patent person, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> patents and IP in general yeah. exploded because of globalization, and the, all of a sudden you're making money all over the world from these things, and that's changed it and, and brought different people in, uh, a, a different system, but juries, there's no choice on it. The Seventh Amendment, you can no, have a jury. I know. Everybody... I've just been reading, for some purpose or other, um, some historical works, the very great um, textbook of patent law in, in uh, 1846 by a man called Heinmarch. And five years later, he wrote a book about patent litigation, the, the patent system. He, beca he, went on, he became one of the commissioners of, the, of uh, Parliament for looking at the new patent system. But he... He positively was writing there, we've got to get rid of jury trial. Yeah, well, okay, I mean... The, the, You're stuck The, the reality it. is the rest of the world feels that way about juries with everything. It's not just in pants. They really think juries don't belong. Oh, I don't think so. I know for, for criminal trials, especially civil... Oh, well, criminal, of course, you're yeah. going to have juries. But outside of that, in civil... Uh, and it, it, so yeah. the United You've States... I actually think a jury is a better system because what happens is, especially in IP now, especially when I get judges like you who have done it for years and can tell what the case is going to be three minutes after getting it, is what you really have to do, if he's on the wrong side, is argue that case for the Court of Appeal if you're in the first instance, uh, where juries is fresh-faced, they're, they're a blank slate, and you could start from scratch, and you have a shot at actually getting something. The sophistication of people in an area, and you, you, of course you want sophisticated judges, but the trouble with sophistication is they've thought about it so often that in a millisecond, they'll tell you what that case is about and what should happen. Oh, I think that's a bit unfair. Well, it could be a bit unfair. <laughs> it could be a bit unfair. But I think it's a natural. I don't, I don't think anyone... That's is, just English a, understatement. Yes, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's not... Uh, a criminal conspiracy, but it's just human nature. The, the more you, the, the more someone is an opera expert, they're going to go to the opera completely different perspective than your brand new. Hey, well, we're, we're not going to agree about juries. I find Americans. The funny part that is, 
I've discovered that one of the things about litigation is everybody thinks their system is perfect and everybody else should be doing the same as theirs. All around the world. The Germans think theirs is perfect. The Dutch think theirs is perfect. And Sweden is, of course, the perfect, and, and so on. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, but well, we won't, won't go on. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I'm reading this as really underneath it all. You're agreeing with me, Rob, and you're just afraid to say it, all right? Uh, you can take it that way if you like. <laughs> all if, right. If the listeners do, they're, they're, they're more full. <laughs> all right. Uh, Unitary Patent Court. You were actually one of the prime movers in the beginning, yeah. and now you're more skeptical. No, I'm not. Oh, no? I, I, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. That, that's, that's down to a bunch of politicians in the German Constitutional Court. But I've had meetings about it the last couple of weeks. Oh, so, but you did go through a skeptical phase. I have a quote from you saying the politicians have messed it all up. Oh, they certainly made it, made it less good than it could have been. Mm. But there may be schemes to get round that, of more and on if it happens. All right, so what are the chances of there being it? Well, I think it's very straightforward. If the German Constitution Court says it is possible by German law, and everybody says that's what they're going to say, but nobody can tell you when, um, then Germany can decide whether or not to ratify. If Germany is rational, they won't ratify until they find out what they're ratifying. Uh, and in particular, whether the UK can be in it. Whether the UK can be in it or not depends on what happened with Brexit. I think if there's a total, um, a, a, a total a hard Brexit, so we just become a third country like America or China, then I don't think it'll happen. Mm. But if we have some other some political deal where we have this customs union or something like that, then it'd be impossible. The Court of Justice have not ruled it out. There is a big, long opinion by a man called Ulrich in, in Max Planck, who's always been opposed to this project. And um, it's, it's so long, and I don't suppose anybody's ever read it. On the whole, if an opinion is that long, then it's not worth reading. All right, so... The others take a much more pragmatic view. Is there going to be a second referendum on Brexit? I don't know. I think it's, 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 the chances of it happening are getting greater. Yeah. Well, if there is, are your fellow citizens going to remain or leave? I don't know. I mean, the polls say they will remain. But then what are, what are the polls know? I think they probably will because I think, that is, it, that I think we, we may be easily bump up to the position that it's either hard Brexit leave altogether, or we remain. I yeah. think there's, there's, there's nothing really logical in between anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> well, I've, uh, my team here knows that I've predicted early on there'll be a second referendum. Yeah. And, and it's going to be remain. We'll see if that happens. But if that is, then we're going to have a unitary patent court. Yeah. And the, what does that mean actually to your system or anyone else's patent well, system? Nobody fully knows. Um, to some extent, I've noticed that everybody seems to think that the unitary patent system will be a, a just a large-scale version of their own system, particularly the Germans seem to think so. But if you look at the rules, they're not. They are an amalgam of common law and civil law procedural rules. There will be differences in different divisions, which is the bit that I don't like. I don't think the court should have divisions at all. Um, as soon as you have divisions, you get different attitudes in different divisions. I mean, you, when you're circuits, you know that. You get mm -hmm. different, different, different views in different circuits. And I'd mix the judges up more, send them all riding on circuit and mixing them all up all the time. So can there be venue? Uh... There will be venue fights. Yeah. Bound to be. Now, how many um, British judges do you think will be part of the system? Well... We would almost certainly have to create another British judge, another British patent judge, beyond the numbers we have now. Um, and some of them might go part time and do part time in the uh, in the in the UPC and part time back in back in the English court. That might be quite attractive. Um, more difficult for the Court of Appeal judge because the silly politicians put the Court of Appeal in Luxembourg. Um, I, I wanted it in Paris. I mean. <laughs> 
on the whole, if you have a court system, it's quite a good idea if you can get to the court. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, know, if, um, you may not have tried to fly to Luxembourg, but if you want to try to fly from Luxembourg, from most countries in Europe, it's a, it's a day's operation. Yeah, I don't disagree. There's some people who think, by the way, the Unitary Patent Court uh, has been Court, Actually called the Unified Patent Court. Unif Uni Unified Patent. Uh, and uh, it started out completely outside of the EU infrastructure. Uh, and was it basically you judges meeting in Venice thinking about this who came up with this? Um, no, it, 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 it was discussed from time to time. There was indeed a creation of a post treaty, the Committee Patent Convention of 1975, which never came into force because nobody wanted it. That would have been in uh, what's now called the EU. Um, then various times, but the judges started meeting and I, uh, I went to my first European judges meeting in Cardiff. They used to meet every two years. Um, and we got to know each other. And we said, this is damn silly what we're doing now. As litigation became more and more international, with the same case being litigated in parallel. And the head of the German patent court um, said, we will create, in, in the Madrid conference of 1998, said, so, well, let's form a group of trying to do something. At the same time, some practitioners were thinking about it. And there was a whole project to produce something, nothing to do with the EU at all. And then the politicians and um, uh, the theoreticians all got involved, and they got, there was some opinion from some, some something called the legal service of the commission. God knows how good they are. So you can't do it without being a member of the European Union, which cut out some countries like Switzerland. Uh, and uh, and then the French wanted to have it all as part of the uh, EU jurisdiction, with ultimate appeal to the. ECJ, as it was then called, um, very theoretical. Industry was saying we're not having that on any basis. And everything you've seen coming from the ECJ shows that the industry was right. Every time they touch an IP case, it goes mad. They've just decided that not using a trademark is an infringement as well, if it was once on the goods. Uh, so, uh, so well, the, basically, I, from my perspective, from the outside, is the commission. Then I think it was uh, DG three E four that had industrial property. Uh, person there said, you know, this is patent policy. We have to do that. It can't be outside. It, we have to be in charge of this. Then that led to other things. And a Supreme uh, Court of Justice case, it said, yes, it has to be to some degree within it. Uh, and that's when I think you started to think uh, all these people are getting in and sort of messing it up. But now you think it's all right in if, some if, sense. If it actually happens, there will be it'll have to apply little bits of, of European Union law, at least to the cases involving a European Union country. But basically, patent law is not about European Union law. The little bits are, there's a thing called the Enforcement Directive, which is about enforcement of intellectual property rights. But that, by and large, doesn't add anything to what the court will be doing anyway. It's largely based, actually, on what we do in England. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have the odd question turning on interpretation of that. There could be competition law defences. You know, people who infringe patents say, well, it's, this is contrary to competition law. It's the pirate's answer to, a, to, a, to a, an infringement case. Um, then there is um, there's something called the Biotech Directive, which I think is probably ultra virus, but still, because you can't, it's it's saying what it, what patent law should be in relation to certain aspects of biotech, which is the EU, but they're legislating in an area which they shouldn't be touching because it's governed by an international treaty, including other countries. It's all been fudged by saying, oh well, it is the same as what the what the international convention says. But in reality, it's quite a it's quite a problem intellectually. So, uh, by the way, we should give a little round of applause to Margot Frohlinger, who has really made this thing happen. Oh, she's she's been she's been dynamic. She, I mean, she was given almost no resources when she was at the commission. No, I mean, what happened is I spoke to her predecessor. Uh, I said, "Is this going to happen?" He said, "Absolutely not. It's dead." And then she replaced him. Yeah. And single-handedly revived it just through her. Willpower. 
Now, sheer willpower and determination, and I'm saying she was not given any resources. I mean, you, you, I mean, nobody seems to know at the Commission that creating a court is a huge enterprise. You have to have rules. They had no machinery for rules. You've got to think of all sorts of things. You've got to think jurisdictions, a lot of legal questions. Um, and she was given almost nothing. I mean, if she was given, she was given the help of a, a couple of assistants, uh, but that was it. Okay. Uh, all right, I have a question. When you were a barrister, what was your typical week like in terms of what you did? Because most of our audience doesn't know this yeah. different systems and all. Okay, well, um, Ken Adamo, who some of the audience will know, said to me that any, in, any American trial la lawyer would think he d died and gone to heaven to be an English barrister because you have much more trial work and, and you are the trial counsel. You're also the specialist counsel. So you, you advise your work. You're, you're really at the apex of the system. It's a very small bar. Even now, it's, although it's bigger, it's... Just well, what's a small bar? Give me a number. Well, I would say there's probably about 50, 60, maximum. Five zero? Yeah, and less than that at the really top. Wow. Okay. Uh, uh, including the older ones and the younger well, ones. Well, you're going to tell me what you do during the week. Okay, so... A lot of crossword puzzles. No, we never did crossword puzzles then, because there wasn't any time. Um, you, you'd go in Monday, depending whether you're in court or not. If you're in court, you'd be in on Sunday, in, in chambers. But don't forget you're a sole practitioner. Or you might be formed in a little team for this case. Um, but you, could, you could be even against somebody in your own chambers, because chambers doesn't mean it's not a firm. You wrote, you're on your own fees, and they're paid to you. But, you know, I talk to solicitors, and I say they do a tremendous amount of work for the barrister. And maybe not getting the credit like you just didn't give them any credit for that. Did, well, you, it, 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 did you find that not helpful? I found that the solicitors varied in quality very considerably. Okay, someone depended on you to do exactly what you, you told them what to do, and they did it. They were very good. Someone wanted to tell you what to do. I didn't get on with such people very well, and they didn't often use me more than, and certainly not more than once. They also rather panicked that I never seemed to read the papers, which is sort of true, but not entirely true. I just read the papers that matter and only at the time when it mattered. Well, that's the same thing you did as a judge, then. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, it's no point in reading. I mean, if you read the papers too far in advance, I mean, the case might settle. Now, do you, a barrister bill by the hour or by the, by the event or? Uh, well, when I was in it, we didn't bill by the hour. Um, I, this hourly billing came in. It was invented by accountants. Came, they, they were hourly billing before lawyers by a long way. And they invented it, and it's all meant to be some control on costs. It's a bit like trying to measure the volume of a swimming pool by measuring one side. Uh, I, I didn't spend a lot of hours. Um, but you wanted a fortune. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's the old story of the man who retired. There's this great steam engine. And he was the guy, old Joe used to look after it. And, it stops, and they bring him out of retirement. And he comes and looks at it. He looks at the front, the back, looks one side, and he goes underneath it. He says, anybody got a hammer? When he passes him a hammer, he goes to the boom, and the machine starts. And then he sends in his bill, 10 pounds. They said, what, just for hitting it with a hammer? He said, well, I'll send you another bill. To so hitting the machine with a hammer, one penny. To knowing that it needed hitting and where to hit it, nine pounds, <laughs> 19 shillings and 11 pence. Okay, as a barrister, <laughs> how often were you upset with the judges or did you think that you actually thought, win or lose, they did a good job in this case? Well, uh, it varied. I mean, there were certain judges who, you know, you just didn't want. I mean, that's it. You, you can't all be good. I'll tell you a story, which I think was, again, that Judge Pat Graham. I did a case when I was junior. I was quite a it was quite a good little interlocutory injunction about a, thing, a bath rack that hung over a bath, a wire frame. And he gave us the injunction. And then uh, another defendant came along and he'd done something slightly different, arguably might infringe with a, quite a liberal doctrine of equivalence. And I was prepared to argue that. But we'd invented Pat and Pat said no. And I said to the client, well, that's appealable because whether we had a doctrine of equivalence was still open and 
then. And um, client paid the greatest tribute you could have to a judge. He said, no, he said, I'll take the opinion of that bloke. Hold it. I couldn't hear that. Say again. I'll take the opinion of that bloke. Really great compliment to a judge. Yeah. He's one of the few judges where 51% customer satisfaction is doing well. Yeah. So, okay, now, so the answer to my question of what did you do during the week was not much. Uh, nothing but barristering, really. Yeah, but barristering was basically you being... Go to court. Your talent in court. I spent 100 days in court in my last year. So that's really where, where the value comes from, is what you're doing in court as opposed to well, the, hours of preparation or something. Uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of hours, there's a lot of hours, most, a lot more than, I mean, the amount of preparation involved for that is huge. And what's more, you have to be ready for it. So I, my way of cross-examining would be, uh, you talk about it a lot before, but the real night before the cross-examination, I was in chambers. All right, getting back to the judges, I have this case and it's this judge. Do you then have to, a to say, well, I'm going to have to actually do a different type of job because this judge is on it, or you do the same judge and just hope? No, you do a different job for different judges. Um, um, as best you can. And what about the Court of Appeal? Uh, how often were you in a Court of Appeal as a barrister? Oh, well, quite a lot. I, I never really thought about it. As by the time I was, I did quite a few as a junior, and I did quite a lot in, uh, I really don't know. And what was your view of the Court of Appeal when you were embarrassed? I thought they were pretty good, actually. Um, they, got to, they got into the case. I mean, there were some of them stupid. There was a, early on, there was a particular judge I never got on with. Um, um, but uh, basically, I, I, I got on with nearly all of them, and I, I quite enjoyed it, actually. Yeah. There, there was, it was a civilised debate in the Court of Appeal, much more discussion than you have in, in your Court of Appeals, of course. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, you go on. Is there a time limit? And it, it... It's got shorter. I mean, but I, I, you know, I did cases in the Court of Appeal um, for, for a week or two weeks. I did My biggest was, well, I think, Well, that's one two... of the reasons you do a week or two weeks, as you are going through case by case and educating the, the court to what cases have said. If they did a little research, you wouldn't have needed two weeks. Yeah, this all depends on the theory that human beings can do research. Don't forget, these guys don't have law clocks. You have a law clock, you pretend you've done the work, and the law clock has done it, really. You don't know whether they've done it right or wrong because you haven't done it yourself. And, and um, I think there's too many law clocks, both in your, in your courts and in, in the European Court of Justice. All right. Tell me what your week was like as a... Uh, okay, let's... No, 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 we're off Barrison now. We're now okay. at Court of First Instance. Uh, okay, well, the Court of First Instance, we have a listing officer whose job is to keep you in work. Um, and they have a list of cases. So they, about three months before cases are supposed to happen, they would fix on a Monday morning three times as many cases as, as there were judges banking on the fact they're going to settle I'm down to and probably more than a third would settle now how much did you have to do and what they, a... i didn't have to do much there if i was listing i was i'd be in charge of the listing of, of patent cases so that i would say i have to be on this one well that one's simple enough it can go off to somebody else the david newberg is still slightly sore that i i, I sent a case about um toilet paper off to him but then he had the other title of Master of the Rolls. He, he likes the joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but I decided that when the cases were going to be, and I pushed them on. I believed in pushing cases on. Because cases either happen, they settle or, or, or not. But while they're hanging about, they're bad commercially, they're costing money. Was one of your jobs, you thought, is to, is to settle a case? No, not much. I, I was quite good at causing them to settle, but... You, you can only do that in court. You can't say you can't. You can't do much else. You can, <clears throat> you can't get involved in any settlement discussions. Can you send you. signals to the parties that you think it should settle? Yeah. Okay. And do I'm I... going to, you know, I, I think something should happen in this case. Why don't you go outside? <laughs> mm. Okay. Now, court of appeal. What is your week like? 
Well, when I first went there, we had seven days out of ten were, were sitting days. And three were reading and, days. And the day is what? Ten to three, ten to four? Uh, the, the, the sitting hours were 10.30 to 4.15 okay. with an hour off for lunch. But sometimes there was something before the, 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 the start. Uh, applications and, uh, and things like that I, for permission to appeal particularly. Um, and then you... You'd, you'd get the papers probably about a week before. The, the presiding judge, you sat in, a, in groups of three, which were changed every three weeks. That was the basic pattern. Mm -hmm. um, and they tried to put on some on the court at least one judge who had a special who had some specialized knowledge of this subject. Um, so and, there'd always be an IP, usually, yeah. of one of the three would be an IP yeah. judge. And as I had said, because I was in charge of the IP list, that this doesn't matter so much. Okay. I would like to be on it, but there's too many things I've either got to do with. All right, so when do you get it's there in the morning? So you get there about um, 9 o'clock, 9.15. And when do you go home? Um, around about 6, actually. And how much do you bring work home with you? I only took, a, I, 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 yeah, I generally take, if I was in court the next day, I'd have the skeleton arguments to read. And the weekends? Not much. Not much. Uh, and which did you enjoy more, first instance or court of appeal? I have enjoyed every job I've done, from being a junior barrister, junior, junior barrister, and I miss every damn one of them. And the answer is, I enjoyed them both in their different ways. All right. If, don't fight the hypothetical. You now have to go back and have one of these jobs for the rest of your life. Not all of them, which is wonderful. <laughs> one of them, whether it's barrister, first instance, court of appeal, paper boy, whatever you want to uh, okay. do, which one would you choose? Deep down barrister. Barrister. Okay. That's good. Um, now, the riding circuit, was that easy, difficult? It was what? huge fun. It was, had some difficulties. Um, and there was a, you're, you're, you're a stranger riding into town, um, and there's a local bar, and you don't know them, and they don't know you. Um, and you have how 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 you're going to run the Chancery Court. New to them, I went to Wales, for example, and I said, right, we're going to double book. I want, I want the list through, and, they, and, and I did that in every place. Uh, and the. One of the Welsh citizens, you can't do that. I said, I'm going to. He was kind enough to write to me after I stopped being the, uh, the Welsh judge, saying you were right. Good. Because you got what well, you got. The, you got the work done. Mm. I mean, you know, there was an Englishman who wrote this book called Parkinson's Law about how the work of two men turns into the work of a giant office, and he the law was that work expands to fill the time available to do it, and it contracts. Now. You're probably one of the uh, most intelligent, brightest people you know. Isn't that right? I'm no. not joking. That wasn't a joke. No, no, I'm I serious. don't think so. I don't think so, actually. Oh, really? Hmm. I, I, I mean, I think the scientists I'm meeting. Oh, the forget sci scientists. The I'm scientists I wanted to be. I'm talking about in the law now. Oh, in the law, it's not so difficult to be said by in the law. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not bad in the law. And so that actually made it easier for you to do a lot in a short amount of term, a time because of the comprehension. So to some extent, what you're saying is the amount of work depends to some degree on my ability to get to the bottom line. Yeah, well, I think that's true. Some judges are faster than others. Some, judges, some are judges are faster than others. Some lawyers are faster than others. Okay, good. All right, we're getting near the end. Um, the future NIP, what do you see? Not patents. I'm talking about IP now. Yeah. We're going to do patents. Well, okay. Well, uh, um, I, I mean, I think it's under constant change. I, I, I am concerned about the uh, ever-increasing reach of trademarks uh, from its straightforward origin function to all sorts of things. I mean, I can see somebody trying to register, register a whole movie and say it's a trademark. You can now register moving images. So why isn't Snow White a trademark? A whole film. All right, other than your, your uh, problems with trademark law, generally speaking, 
All right, let's go to patent law, the future of uh, patent law. What do you see for it? Well, I think it's a, it, it, an extraordinarily powerful system which has been adapt adapting itself now for 400 years. So I, I, I think it has a pretty bright future. Some people say, oh, it's terrible. There are so many Chinese patents being applied for and so on and so forth. The patent system will adapt. There will be ways of doing it. Some will be prior art searching done by AI and so on and so forth. But I think it will work. It will remain a huge driver for innovation. Now, you're aware of what people perceive as, in the United States, a problem now in patent law, particularly caused by the U.S. Supreme Court. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I'm afraid I think your, your, some of your Supreme Courts are wrong. Some are kind of worse than wrong. Uh, particularly this concept of abstract. They're unintelligible. Yeah, I don't. I think a lot of people agree with you. So I, I, I but, haven't met anybody who doesn't. All right, <laughs> but you just said it's going to be okay, and a lot of people it, think it, it isn't it, going to be okay. So you're saying over time this will revert back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, those guys, great guys, I went to chambers with them. Blanco White says it, it all goes in big swings. In the 1930s, he said you couldn't get a patent action. You couldn't win a patent action. Um, they were perceived as interfering with employment, and there was a time of great unemployment, and, and maybe that's the reason he attributed it anyway. I think it's more emotional than that. Okay. All right, now, we've just been given the one hour and 10 minutes thing. We have five minutes left. I'm going to give you five minutes to discuss how wonderful you think the Fordham IP conference is, the round table, and the director of the Fordham. I'm joking, I don't want to hear anything. I do want to say something about the Fordham conference. Okay. I think what you've done with that conference has had a huge unifying and really important effect, which we can't measure it, doesn't mean it hasn't been immense. And you ought to be congratulated. Well, thank you very you much. You really thought of it way ahead of anybody else's time. Well, thank you very and much. And I'm very grateful for the, the, the times I've spent at your conference. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I very much appreciate that. So, one to ten, where ten being a, the actual best it can be, one being uh, not obviously very good. Uh, this is the last question. So IP in the next three years will just say, give me a number of one to 10 of what you think it'll be. 10 being really fantastic. I know it's difficult. This is putting a lot of things together, yeah. but uh, just to get a sense of your view of the future. I, I, I'd say it's going to be probably about five. I think that we will see the increase of China in the next five years, or next three years, I forget how many you gave me, which I think is very significant. It is three years, I get it. Yeah. The Chinese have, Chinese have, have, have really actually bit the bullet on patents. They've come to the conclusion that this pays. Uh, once upon a time, they were copyists, but they've now decided that patents pay. And they're probably right. I think that in, in, in two or three years' time, we'll see greater influence. It may be resistance to Chinese patents by the United States and by Europe um, as they become more and more important. Suddenly, the boot will be on the other foot, if you like. Mm. Um, and that will be, I think, has started and I think will increase in the next five years, next three years, next 10, 15 years. Um, and they will be enforcing patents more strongly than the United States maybe by then. Of course, if you say enforce, I mean, actually, they've got a, quite a way to go. It's not just making an order, it's making an order work, which you have to have. Enforcement means both. And they've got quite a long way on the latter to go. Um, as regards trademarks, I suspect, them, I hope, that the time has come uh, to realise they're going too far and they need to be reined in and back, back but I, I can't see any sign of it anywhere yet. Um, Copyright? Copyright is the hardiest of them all, really, because it's, it's, it is so responsive to technology, which has been, it's, it exists because of technology pretty well, 
um, uh, and it will always be dragging behind the technology. But there, there will be a constant change in copyright law, in legislative change. And that change will be good, bad, or indifferent? I like to think it'll be good, but I wouldn't guarantee it. All right. Well, Robin, thank you very much. We very much appreciate this. This has been a very educational, interesting, and fun hour. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you for listening to this episode of Non-Obvious with Hugh Hansen. This episode was recorded on December 14th, 2018.